Well, good afternoon and welcome to the RSPB's uh, latest webinar. This one's called UK Nature-Based Solutions. Um, hopefully you've all arrived at the webinar safe and sound and that you're all doing okay. Um, my name is Martin Harper and I'm the Conservation Director of the RSPB. And uh, my job uh, this afternoon is really to uh, chair the session and make sure we have a really good debate. Um, I'm actually going to start off with some housekeepings before doing a little bit of context, if that's okay for you all. Um, I can see people still arriving, which is absolutely fine. Um, and the first thing I should say is it's worth noting that the session is being recorded uh, and it will be available to view after the webinar. Um, other thing to say, uh, and please do respect this, is that the images used in the presentations are under copyright and so they're not for general use. So. Uh, um, uh, please don't use screenshots. Um, in terms of how we're going to manage the commentary on this, um, we really do want it to be a good old debate. Uh, and so there's both a, a question and answer what's Q&A box as well as a chat box at the bottom of your screens. Um, and if you'd like to pose any questions during the presentations, please do use the Q&A function. And this is being monitored by a couple of my colleagues, Becca and Fiona. Um, and then at the end of the three presentations, and um, we'll come to those later on. Uh, if you want to put stuff in the chat column, you're very free at any point. Um, and if you have any problems seeing or hearing uh, all of this, um, please do let Becca or Gabby know, and they will try and help. Um, okay, so um, the context for this obviously is that um, there's a lot of focus on nature-based solutions at the moment and the RSPB does a lot of work in this area both in terms of science and in terms of policy in terms of practice as well uh, and uh, nature-based solutions are really the things that nature can provide to help deliver solutions to all the wider societal problems that we have. You might have seen some of the work the RSPB has done around our carbon nature mapping, helping to target areas in terms of win-wins, in terms of nature restoration and climate change. You might have even um, seen or taken part in the Dragon Dens webinar on policy solutions that we ran earlier. Um, but the most important thing, obviously, is what happens on the ground. And uh, recently, we profiled some of the work we've been doing with our bird life partners in West Africa. And today, we're going to be putting a spotlight on some big projects which are providing really big nature based solutions across the UK. And to help us, I'm delighted that I'm going to be joined by three colleagues um, today. Jeremy Roberts, Kate Hanley and Lee Locke. Uh, and what they will do is in turn, they'll showcase um, nature-based solutions around woodlands, upland, peatland and, um, and, and the coast. And what they're going to do is provide you all with an overview of each of their projects. And they're gonna conclude with government recommendations, um, which of course will be devolution compliant uh, and which, which are needed in order to scale up um, the contribution that these sort of projects can make to tackling the climate and ecological emergency. Um, I'm really hopeful that even though you can't today go and see these sites, um, that what you'll hear will be inspiring both for you as individuals, but also in terms of inspiring more action from governments um, to try and take action. And hopefully there's loads of lessons to be learned. Um, so you're going to hear a lot from these three speakers, they're all going to speak in turn, I'm going to introduce each of them in turn, and then at the end um, you'll have this opportunity to do Q&A. And at that point I'll also uh, introduce a, a fourth member of the, of the panel who, who has more of a, a policy expertise. Um, so the first um, speaker today is uh, uh, my colleague uh, Jeremy Roberts. Uh, Jeremy has been working at the RSPB um, well, for 23 years, uh, and he started off as, a, as, as an advisor to farmers and other land managers, then he moved to head of reserves in Scotland, uh, and then he got the absolute plum job in 2005 of running Abernethy um, Nature Reserve, which is just a fabulous part of the Cairngorms, huge site, which I know that he'll talk to you about, and home to some of the just most special wildlife in the whole of the UK. Um, he then was also absolutely instrumental in forging an even bigger a project, a partnership project with other land managers um, uh, called Cairngorms Connect uh, and that is just going from strength to strength and uh, he is now the program manager for the Cairngorms Connect partnership. I'm now going to turn off my um, video and over to you Jeremy. Thanks very much <coughs> Martin um, and good afternoon everyone. Over the next 10 minutes 
I'll be describing the work the Cairngorms Connect Partnership's been undertaking uh, to deliver nature-based solutions through woodland restoration. But I'll start with a brief introduction to the partnership project. Sorry, folks. So Cairngorms Connect uh, is the biggest hab habitat restoration project in the UK. Uh, you can see its location there, the dark green area uh, in, the, in the middle of the Cairn, or on the edge of the Cairngorms National Park in Scotland. It's about 13% of the national park. And the partnership covers 60,000 hectares. So that's around about, well, that's 600 square miles, so around about 200, sorry, 600 square kilometers, around about 230 square miles of contiguous land. And that scale and connectedness are key attributes in ecological restoration and in nature-based solutions. And that's a theme that I'll be returning to. The area is managed collabor collaboratively by four partners, the RSPB, which is around about 25%, and you can see the blue areas there, Wild Land Limited, which is a private landowner, um, Anders Paulson, uh, and that's the dark blue area, and then two government agencies, Nature Scott, which was until recently, uh, which was SNH, um, and Forestry and Land Scotland, and between them they manage the remainder. So individually the partners have been managing these areas for decades, um, but uh, formed the partnership in 2016, and together they share this fantastic 200 year vision. And you may have been among the two million or so folk that saw the project featured uh, so spectacularly on Winter Watch. And I know it can be hard to imagine what 600 square kilometers looks like. I'm struggling a bit to get the controls to work here, folks. Uh, so what I've done here is I've superimposed the Cairngorms Connect area over London, and you can see it just about fits within the M25. Uh, and then in the lower picture, the northeast corner is, is right on Whitehall. So you can see that it would stretch right the way down to to Godalming, so uh, a really huge area. Uh, I'm sorry folks, this is, uh, the controls are not doing what I want them to do. So this is, this is the uh, Abernethy Reserve that the RSPB has. Um, and this is a huge area of ancient Caledonian pine wood. Um, and it's, it, it, woodlands are a vital aspect of the UK landscape and have been for a key part of human society for as long as people have been here. And as well as providing habitats for special wildlife, they bring us a whole range of other benefits, including recreation, carbon storage, flood management, health, and they're important to our economy as well. However, a number of factors have been putting serious pressure on our forests, especially agriculture and urban expansion. And the UK is now one of the least wooded areas of Europe. This map shows the Cairngorms National Park with the Cairngorms Connect area in black and the green area is existing woodland. The two shades of blue are potential woodland and the pink area is potential for rare montane woodland. There are about 130 square kilometers of woodland in the partnership area and the potential and the partner's ambition is to double this to 260 square kilometers so all of it's connected so turning the blue and the pink areas to green this slide shows glenfeshi which is part of what wild land limited and kengorms connect woodlands are diverse in character from scotland's biggest remnants of spectacular ancient Caledonian pine woods to native Scots pine plantation and stands of non-native conifers and non-native removal uh, and restructuring plantations are major elements in our restoration program and there are these large expansions of heather moorland reaching up to harsh subalpine plateau and these are the areas that we're hoping to spread the forest over so our forest exp expansion ambition will take the forest to its natural altitudinal limit including these rare high altitude montane woodlands. And the biggest challenge for woodland expansion in the highlands is browsing damage caused by high deer populations. We have a collaborative deer management program over 60,000 hectares, which is largely undertaken by an in-house team working across partnership boundaries. And as well as protecting the young trees that regenerate or are planted, deer reduction enables recovery of other habitats 
uh, such as overgrazed blanket box. So deer reduction combined with good seed sources can achieve amazing and transformational results. RSPB's Avanesi Reserve here in the top has been deer management there for 30 years and Wildlands Glen Feshi, these are obviously before and after pictures, at one time devastated by high deer populations is now one of the most dramatic examples of habitat recovery and natural regeneration in Scotland. If you see that then at a landscape scale, it can be remarkable, gradually establishing thousands of hectares, millions of new, of, of new trees, new forest, all without the use of deer fencing. And it's most evident when we have snow cover, such as here, uh, FLS's Glenmore Forest. The summit on the left is 811 metres above sea level, and I'd like to just note where the 450 metre uh, above sea level contour is there. Uh, that'll be relevant in a moment. So this site is on Wildland Limited's property in the southern part of the Kengums Connect area, and it's at the earliest stages of the restoration journey. So again, this is the 450 metre contour, and you can see that by comparison, there are very few trees. So in these areas, we need to resort to planting native trees to establish new woodlands. And Wildland have now planted 4 million trees. Recognition of the importance of woodlands, especially for carbon sequestrations, recently fueled development of a range of tree planting strategies and many of you will remember how the scale of promised tree planting became a political issue in the last general election. However, planting has to be done in the right way and combined ideally with natural regeneration. The right trees must be planted in the right place and, and we need quality as well as quantity to ensure long-term benefits for, for biodiversity, uh, for carbon, for storage and for people. So in this slide, I've shown you what our targets are in 2023, uh, and the woodland ones are highlighted in dark green. We're looking for 800 hectares of New Scots pine regeneration and 600 hectares of new native woodland planting. And those are the, the, these objectives listed here are about reducing carbon emissions, principally peatlands here, and increasing carbon sequestration. But beyond that, we can look at mitigating for the likely effects of climate change. So this is another important element of nature-based solutions. Again, I've, sh I've highlighted the woodland ones in a slightly darker color. So increasing coarse vegetation and tree cover increase ca increases the catchment friction and that then slows the movement of water through the catchment and is one of a number of, of, uh, of uh, mitigations here that reduce the uh, risk of downstream flooding. More vegetation, more tree growth increases water uptake, so deer management helps with, with that extra vegetation. And a bigger forest is more able to accommodate the ecological impacts that we can expect to result from climate change. So we may see more fire, we may see more disease, we may, we may see more wind throw. So by having bigger forests, we're much more resilient to that. And wooded habitats are a lower fire risk than the open uh, ground habitats that we, we see in many areas. Wooded catchments really importantly reduce the warming of water courses, which is particularly important for, for salmon and other uh, freshwater biodiversity. And it's a, a key point here for us is that the River Spey, that the, the project occupies 20% of the catchment of the River Spey, so it's all in that one catchment. So the benefits are, are even better. If we can operate within catchments and at a catchment scale, those nature-based solutions are far better. Woodlands have had the most political recognition as a nature-based solution to climate change, but they've got their greatest value when they contribute to a wider e ecological network. And the connected nature of Cairngorms Connect also benefits the 5,000 recorded species in the area, of which 20% are nationally rare or scarce. And our ambition is a seamless landscape for wildlife and for people to enjoy. So for example, we have 11 species of regularly breeding raptors, including white-tailed eagles here, uh, which are free from raptor persecution. Without monitoring, we can't evaluate the achievements of our restoration work, and we're monitoring nine key indicators, and these are a combination of habitats and species, ecosystem services, but also societal indicators that are listed there, economic benefits, sense of empowerment and influence in communities, and public attitudes to restoration. And we so that see those as just important as indicators of our success. The 
Kangloms Connect project in 2018, we were awarded 5 million US dollars by the Endangered Landscapes Programme, one of only eight beneficiaries across Europe. And this is a, a from the from Arcadia, the charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. And this has given us a massive uh, opportunity to step up the pace of the project. But in addition to that, we've very much relied on Scottish forestry grants, on the Peatland Restoration Fund from uh, Nature Scott, uh, and from the, currently managed by the Kingdoms National Park. And the Scottish Government places significant emphasis on empowering communities uh, for involvement in decision making about land management. So from what I've said so far, it'll come as no surprise when I say that for woodlands to deliver nature-based solutions, we need policies and funding that operates in a number of ways. We need it to operate at large scale uh, and ideally in a connected way. So that enables collaboration of many land managers together. So something that supports that is good. Ideally within single catchment units. We need to put the right trees in the right place and ideally favor natural processes. And we need consistent funding over a long duration. Ideally support for monitoring indicators would be great and opportunities to communicate and consult with uh, and involve local communities is key as well. So this has just been a very brief and, and uh, slightly te technologically inept uh, account of just one aspect of Kengons Connect's partnership project uh, and partnership work. If you'd like to know more, we have uh, a website. Uh, please take a look at that and you'll also find us on Twitter and on Instagram. Thanks very much for listening. Brilliant, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, a few little hiccups, but it flowed beautifully. So uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, I think um, we'll see you at the end of all the presentations um, because um, for those of you might have been arriving a bit late, just to say we've got these three presentations coming through uh, and then we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. By all means, do use the Q&A function now or indeed the chat function now. Um, one of you is going to have to be the first to do so, so I suggest you get stuck in. Um, lots of um, food for thought from Jeremy's presentation about um, what we can do in terms of you know, large scale woodland expansion and how you best do that. But we're now going to move on to a soggier habitat uh, and um, uh, Kate Handley is going to be talking to you about peat. Um, those of you who don't know Kate, she's um, got the fantastic job of being site manager um, at Dovestone, um, which is one of our sites um, in sort of in the north of the Peak District. Uh, now Kate's been there for over a decade uh, and she's been heavily involved in some of the really big capital delivery of sort of the big blanket bulk restoration work we've done at this site. Um, Interesting and varied career. It says here that um, previously Kate's been a ghillie on Highland Stalking Estate, Reserves Officer of the Gwent Wildlife Trust, Local Council TPO Officer, but now she's got the fantastic job of looking after the gem that is Dovston. Over to you, Kate. Thanks very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Great to know that so many people are here, even if we're not face to face. So I'm here to talk about peatland, but I will also be talking about the landscape as a whole, so an English upland landscape with a focus on peatland. So I want to talk about nature-based solutions that could be delivered from an English upland landscape. So nature-based solutions to the climate and biodiversity crises really depend on achieving complexity in the landscape, which delivers resilience to everything that climate change has to throw at it. So. What we want to see is a really complex landscape that is saturated, that holds water, that reduces water flow, that provides clean water for treatment, that has trees and scrub in it, that pro provides high levels of biodiversity, that sequesters carbon, all those eco ecosystem services that we should expect from our upland landscapes. Sadly, the English upland landscape in general is a little bit more simple than that currently. So most English upland landscapes are composed of simple vegetation communities. They lack complexity and resilience, and they really underperform at the moment um, in the delivery of those ecosystem services that we all need to survive and thrive from our upland landscapes. So an English upland landscape would typically be considered vast monocultures of heather, which are pretty, but don't really function very well pretty treeless um, and a, a lot of sheep grazing. And all of that has been driven by subsidy. So no fault, no blame to anybody. 
but really could be better now. So that lack of resilience leads to problems like erosion, low and fluctuating water tables, unreliable water supply. Uh, you either get flooding, bottom left, or you get drought, top left. It leaves the landscape vulnerable to fire um, and erosion, constantly losing lots of carbon. So we are most certainly not sequestering carbon yet, and actually we are emitting carbon from most of our upland landscapes. Problems with drought, low biodiversity, the list goes on really. So really we need to think about what could we be getting from our upland landscapes and how we're going to go on that journey and what we've done to start that journey so far. So carbon sequestration, really important to try and reduce the impact of climate change, but also to make the landscape more resilient to whatever climate change throws at us. Clean drinking water, regulation of peak flows, reducing downstream flood risk, resilience in the landscape against fires and droughts. We are definitely seeing our weather patterns changing now. Last few years, we've really seen some long dry springs and summers. A more intact and resilient landscape would be much better able to cope with that. P healthy soils, pollinator populations, our uplands should be buzzing with pollinators and currently they're really quite quiet. Um, biodiversity, obviously a really key uh, ecosystem service for us, food services, so we by no means want to see these landscapes divorced from people and farming and the production of food. Absolutely possible to have all of these services delivered in tandem with each other. And of course health and well-being, connection of people to a wilder and functioning landscape leads to healthy and happy people and a thriving economy. So what can we do then to change picture on the left, which is uh, the Dove Stone edges as they were 10 years ago, heading towards the picture on the right, which is not Britain, but does illustrate a more complex and wetter upland landscape. So Dove Stone, uh, where I work, is a partnership site between United Utilities, the big water company, um, and the RSPB. It is a 4,000 hectare site, so that's the same as 40, 40 square kilometres, uh, covers three farm tenancies and the, one of the really important things is that it is sat in a landscape, so top left picture, of other land managers who want to deliver the same thing. So there's truly potential here for massive, massive landscape scale restoration work. So Dovestone in the past has suffered from um, overgrazing, delivered by, um, driven by subsidy payments. Um, it suffered from too much burning and it's really suffered from atmospheric pollution from the surrounding towns and cities. All those things together have simplified and in some cases actually removed the vegetation communities entirely. So it's no surprise at all that we had been losing tons and tons and tons of carbon from the hill in the form of peat in lumps and also as oxidized carbon from the peat decaying. So United Utilities started in 2005 um, and started revegetating the bare peat, fantastically successful and really reduced the amount of peat that was coming off in the water. The RSPB then continued from 2010 and started with a lot of water table restoration work, so gully blocking. So if you look at the bottom pictures, 2010 to 2018, you can see a system that has been blocked with stone and you can see how it's gone from an eroding, more or less vegetationless channel that all it does is support transport water and peat off the hillside to a channel that is holding permanent water and supporting bog communities, permanently saturated peat and keeping the carbon on the hill where it belongs. So over the last 10 years or so, we've delivered 10 and a half thousand dams on average, and this is a very rough average, but on average, each dam will hold around about 10 tonnes of water. So you're looking at about 100,000 tonnes of water kept on the hill every time it rains. And that is a massive, massive difference to the amount of water that is coming quickly off the hill. And that is a huge nature-based solution uh, for flooding. We've also planted around about 750 hectares worth of sphagnum moss, massively keystone plant for the restoration of blanket bogs. All of that delivered by the most amazing local volunteers. So 45,000 hours the local community here has invested in this site and it's just phenomenal. And in pretty dreadful weather too. Um, and the benefits aren't just for the land and they aren't just for the obvious reduction in flood risk, the carbon sequestration, et cetera, et cetera. You've got the benefits of connecting people to a wilder landscape, bit more adventurous, 
bit more interesting. People are getting hands on, they're getting involved, and that's massive for massive from a health and well-being point of view and the potential for social prescribing, driven by our volunteers again. We also do a lot of advocacy and demonstration. Um, it's no good developing all these techniques if we don't share it and we don't talk about it. Um, I won't bother naming them all, apart from the bottom left, of course, um, seen as uh, Jeremy talked about Winter Watch. So we did, we did appear on Spring Watch. Um, we are also an award-winning partnership, both international and national. So we're really quite big hitting from the point of view of blanket bog restoration. Niche, I know, but still pretty good. So, and it's working. So early indications, and we've got to remember that the degradation of the habitat has been going on for multiple centuries and we're only 15 years into the restoration process, but it's going really well. So the top three, Golden Plover, Dunlin and Curlew, I think you can see especially have done extremely well. So Dunlin in particular have gone from the edge of extinction in 2004 uh, pre-restoration to 49 pairs last year and what's interesting as well is red grouse are also steadily increasing despite the fact that we do not manage specifically for them and it's all down to increasing a more stable wetness in the soil which leads to better tipulid populations and those are the insects that these birds feed on. Also seeing early indications of increasing um, improving water quality so less particulate carbon in the water so yeah, we're doing well, but we are by no means at the end of the journey and there is a lot to do yet. So where are we going and how are we gonna get there? Funding, it's the old, it's the perennial problem. These things cost money. Massive amount of damage over the past several centuries and we are attempting to reverse this. A lot of it is large contractor scale, scale work and although we have the most amazing um, input from our local volunteers, it still costs us a lot of money to do this. We are currently funded by an EU life grant. Um, at the moment, as I speak, we have two diggers on the hill delivering peat dams for us with volunteers going behind planting sphagnum. Um, so we've got one and a half thousand dams going in this month, but it costs money. The EU life grant finishes this year and where we go next, we're not entirely sure yet as we are leaving the EU and that sort of big funding will now need to be provided by our own government for the delivery of these ecosystem services and nature-based solutions. So everybody can do something to help, no matter where you live, what you do, whether you're a practitioner in this, you can, or, or a hands-on person, or whether you're something, somebody who's never even thought about a peak bog before, and I suspect there are probably a few people out there who haven't really yet. Um, so you can ask the government, to deliver strong, clear and long lasting policy on peatland restoration, on catchment management, including trees in the uplands, absolutely an essential part of the uplands. I have talked about peat bog, but we are looking at the landscape as a whole and to support a green recovery, incredibly important. So please support from everybody, support the campaigns, get on social media, write to your MP, It'd be fabulous. Thank you very much. Kate, that was absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. Lots of common themes actually coming through from Kate's talk and Jeremy's talk. And it's nice to see some of the questions and commentary coming through on Q&As. Please do um, post them thick and fast in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, so we've moved from trees to peat and then we're now going to head for the coast uh, and we're going to be handing over to my colleague Lee Locke, uh, who Lee's got a couple of years on Jeremy. He's been working for the RSPB for over 25 years and has a range of conservation roles. Uh, and in the last few years, he's been focusing primarily on species recovery, um, but he's also now got responsibility for overseeing all of the RSPB's work around the UK and coasts and wetlands, including offshore islands. Uh, I think if Lee appears, I'm gonna hand over to him. Over to you, Lee. Thank you, Martin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to be able to talk about the role that coastal habitats can play as a nature-based solution to the problems of climate change and flooding on our coasts. And I'll highlight the importance of our coast for wildlife, for the economy, and therefore the values that restoring our coasts can bring. From a global perspective, the UK coastline is our outstanding asset. Three million water birds using the East Atlantic Flyway moving from the Arctic down to Africa, 
10% of the water birds of Northwest Europe, millions of breeding seabirds. This is the UK's natural crown jewels, and it's reflected in a network of international designations around our coast. But the UK's coast and estuaries are also places where we live, work, relax and play. They help protect us from flooding, support our fisheries and attract millions of visitors. Just think where everyone went as soon as lockdown was restricted. And in fact, it's estimated that the value of these services provided by our coastal habitats is approximately 48 billion pounds. But this coastal zone is in trouble. Um, the RSPB completed a report uh, called Sustainable Shores in 2018, and we reviewed the status of coastal habitats in the UK. And this highlights huge past losses since the Second World War, a poor quality of remaining habitats, and we predicted further losses of 3,000 hectares of coastal habitat by 2050 due to climate change, sea level rise, and increased coastal erosion. And if you also factor in that this remaining habitat becomes increased under, put under increasing recreational pressure, um, the, the value of those habitats is further diminished. It's estimated that 10% of recreational activity is occurring on 0.6% of the land area in this coastal strip. But fortunately, there's some good news. The Sustainable Shores report went on to highlight opportunities for coastal habitat creation, and these are all supported by current management policies. So we identified over 30,000 hectares of opportunity around the, around the coast. 13,000 of these were particularly high priority. Uh, you can see where these are around the UK is a particular concentration in England between the Humber and the Thames, but, but opportunities uh, throughout the UK. And there's more than enough here to compensate for the past losses and the predicted losses. In England, this delivering this habitat would contribute to targets under the 25-year environment plan and would deliver the Environment Agency Flood and Coastal Erosion Management Strategy. And just this week, the Environment Agency launched an innovative flood and coastal resilience program uh, which will look to develop projects in 25 new areas and I very much look forward to engaging with that and seeing how we can join that up with the Sustainable Shores work. So creating new intertidal habitats such as salt marsh, seagrass beds, reefs and mud flats also represents a nature-based solution to lock in huge amounts of carbon salt marshes and sequester two to four times more carbon than terrestrial forests per area. Also homes and businesses are at much greater risk of flooding when we lose this natural buffer zone which would normally absorb strong waves and soak up excess rain and seawater during peak levels. And the Natural Capital Committee recognises that there is, quote, good evidence that stopping further losses of habitat and creating more coastal habitat is a cost effective measure in managing the rising costs of coastal defence. So our coast can help us adapt to climate change, help store carbon, protect us from flooding if we accelerate and invest in their protection and restoration. But how can this habitat be created? The main technique is through managed realignment, which is a nature-based solution on the coast where traditional sea defences are removed and set back, and the salt marsh and intertidal habitat can fill in the space. So 2,500 hectares of coastal habitat have been created in the UK since the year 2000, uh, with the RSPB involved in about a third of this area. This slide shows Medmarine Sussex, where 200 hectares of wetland habitat protects 348 properties and about 5,000 residents from coastal flooding. And it also provides a range of other benefits. And the Environment Agency who led this project estimate that the overall value is 90 million pounds compared with a project cost of only 28 million. So a clear economic benefit. The largest managed realignment project in the UK is Wallasey Island in Essex. 
This is a scheme which was supported by DEFRA, the Environment Agency, Natural England, Crossrail and the RSPB and has seen the creation of approximately 700 hectares of intertidal habitat from arable. So this has significantly increased the carbon sequestration capacity of the land. It provides enormous recreational tourism benefits, fisheries benefits and long-term flood benefits. But note that both Medmary and Wallasey were identified through an opportunity mapping exercise that the RSPB led in 2000, so it was a precursor for sustainable shores. So creating sites like Wallasey has taken 20 years of planning, preparation and delivery to get to this point. So we do need to identify this new pipeline of coastal projects now and start working on them ASAP if they're going to start to bring in their positive impacts before 2050. Alongside managery alignment, this um, managery alignment can be supplemented by techniques such as using dredge material from our coastal waterways. So currently less than 1% of the material is reused to deliver environmental benefits and instead is dumped at sea as waste. Potentially this is a massive and game-changing opportunity for coastal habitat creation and management. Instead of dumping at sea, this can be used to raise the level of shingle islands and banks for nesting birds, create intertidal features which protect existing salt marshes and reefs or provide conditions for their creation and regeneration. And there is often a perception that climate change impacts are going to occur in the longer term. Uh, but we need this action now. So this slide shows a little tern eggs being flooded at high tide. Little terns nest very close to the high tide, so are probably the species most vulnerable from rising sea level rise. And in 2018, 20% of the nests in the UK were flooded out over one weekend of high tides. This is an increasing problem and you can see how uh, using beneficial use and other schemes to recharge coastal habitats can have an instant and much needed effect. There are also brackish and freshwater habitats behind the seawall uh, which are important. So these often lack fresh water and because of increasing drought periods over the summer and have to uh, suffer the effects of periodic saltwater incursion. And the solution is through careful hydrological management by putting in sluices, drains and lagoons. These sites can then have a major role in managing flood risk along with their role in delivering nature. And finally, this is a, a slide which shows Minsmere in Suffolk, and this illustrates the nature-rich habitats that sit along the coastal strip. But I wanted to highlight Minsmere because it, it, it indicates the social, economic and recreational benefits offered by a, a nature-rich coastline. Minsmere receives over 100,000 visitors a year, providing benefits to health and well-being through enhanced contact with nature. And these visitors are also estimated to bring in 3.8 million a year to the local economy and employ more than 100 jobs in the local community. Our aim is to create a network of Medmarys, Wallaceys and Minsmeres around the coast which help drive a transformative programme of habitat creation. And so to conclude, coastal habitat creation is a key part of our green recovery. We need to develop innovative partnerships between local communities, government, private investors, NGOs to deliver large scale nature based solutions. But this will deliver jobs, a resilient economy, healthy communities and a thriving natural world. Thank you. Brilliantly, thanks very much. Uh, and if any of you take The Guardian, there's a wonderful article on the uh, on Wallasey in today's issue, but that was a fantastic tour de force of all of our coastal work, Lee. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna ask um, folk to do now is can I have the speakers reveal themselves again on the screen uh, by turning their video cameras on? That includes UK, very good. Uh, and I'm also going to welcome Melanie Coth who is our principal policy officer working on climate change and is a particular expert on this, um, on nature-based solutions. So this is your panel uh, and um, the questions have been coming in thick and fast. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read out the question that um, I'm gonna pick and then gonna direct it at a panelist and I'm gonna try and get through as many as possible. 
Um, and the first question is coming from Chris Grayling, Grayling who I know is a great supporter of these issues. Uh, and um, uh, Chris's question is, uh, hang on a sec, where's it gone? I've lost it, it's lost it. It's, it's, <laughs> um, if I go to the answer live, I go to done, I'm told. Right, I don't have that, unfortunately. So unfortunately, you're going to have to, uh, uh, the, the question's gone for my box, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, so I think I'm I can try... remember most of it, Martin. Okay, go for it, Jeremy. So I think what the, the point that Chris was making was about uh, quite often plantations are dark and not particularly biodiverse. Uh, and therefore, were we using other species, particularly uh, broadleaf species, to, to diversify the woodlands through planting? And whilst that's true of many non-native conifer plantations, so spruce and, uh, and uh, some of the other species, with Scots pine, it, Scots pine are the, are the native, they're the dominant native uh, tree in the highlands. So our native woodlands have a lot of Scots pine. Uh, and underneath Scots pine plantations, even relatively densely planted, if they're managed properly, we do still get very good field layer, very good biodiversity. But what we are doing is restructuring them, creating more space, um, creating more deadwood, which is a really important part of any woodland, but, but in particular for our pine woods. And in terms of diversifying the species, certainly, uh, about 20% of the, the, the species in a Caledonian pine wood would be broad, broadly species. So where we're doing planting, it's including species like aspen, birch, uh, not rowan, which are very, very effectively distributed by birds. So, so yes, plantations can be a problem, but Scots pine plantations are actually pretty good. Great, thanks, Jeremy. And uh, I am a fool. I've now worked out my instructions and how I can find the questions. I apologise to everybody. And uh, the next question is going to be for Melanie. Actually, it comes from Friends of the Earth, uh, and the question is, how can we? ensure the quality and integrity of nature-based solutions. Um, over to you, Melanie. Thank you very much, Martin. Yeah, and a really important question. Um, it's so important that we get nature-based solutions right. And obviously the webinar today has been about showcasing some great examples of nature-based solutions done well. Um, but also there are some practices that can be done in the name of MBS that can be damaging to people or wildlife or even the climate. Um, so we've been working with Oxford University and other NGOs and academic institutions to come up with some principles to make sure that they are done really well and to guide policy. I'm just going to share those with you very briefly because they speak to the heart of the question from Friends of the Earth. Um, the first is that nature-based solutions must be additional to um, the reductions in the fossil fuel sector um, and not instead of eliminating emissions from that sector. So all sectors need to progress as rapidly as possible towards net zero and nature can then add additional carbon sequestration on top of that. And that's absolutely key. The second point is the importance of protecting a whole range of ecosystems. People tend to focus a lot on trees, but um, other ecosystems have so much to offer as we've heard today. The third is always to make sure that we engage with and have consent from local communities and internationally indigenous peoples uh, so that we're working with people. And finally, from uh, RSPB's point of view, a, very, a really key one that we're sustaining and enhancing biodiversity. And I think it speaks to the question that Chris Grayling raised just now. Um, you know, large scale single species tree plantations are not what we would classify as a nature based solution. So these principles were shared with Alok Sharma um, on his first day as COP president. But the UK has a fantastic opportunity to champion these in our own legislation with the tree strategy, the peat strategy, but also internationally with our NDC and the nature theme at COP26. So really important to get this right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Melanie. I'm just going to keep going through the questions, actually. Um, if people want to come back, there's a chat bar. Uh, and again, you can ask the follow up questions. The next one's on John Anderson. Uh, and I think I'm going to start off going towards um, Jeremy, although Kate might want to pile in as well. If peat holds more carbon dioxide by, per square metre than forested land, planting trees drives the peat out, thus releasing CO2. How do you deal with this? Um, uh, Jeremy, do you want to start off? Yeah, I mean, there are very strict controls of, uh, with planting on, on deep peat. I mean, many of the soils that we have here, uh, there are quite often some shallow peats over um, glacial material. So sometimes we're planting into shallow peat, but the absolute uh, very clear guidance from Scottish Government, and we want to do the same ourselves anyway, is to avoid planting uh, on peat. So it, it's kind of it's built into the guidance and very strictly applied by, by the grant offering uh, bodies um, and yeah so wh wherever we've got deep peat we're looking at the measures similar to the sorts that, that Kate's described to restore the peatlands 
and where we've got dry heath, uh, which is, is kind of less peat rich uh, and, and has the potential for woodland, that's where we're focusing the woodland effort. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. And of course, we're still dealing with the legacy of poor planting schemes historically, just north of where you are in the flow country, we're still having to try and get rid of some of those uh, non-native um, conifers which were planted up on the, the flow country, so um, legacy of bad policy. Um, next one's coming to you, Kate, then hopefully there's going to be one for you, Lee, in a minute. Um, Kate, um, you, you were saying in the chat bar to me you didn't get enough time to talk about scrub anyway, so a question's come in uh, saying that uh, from Vincent um, McAllendon, um, hopefully I've said your name correctly, Vincent, um, Kate mentioned scrub and benefit in the same sentence, a rare thing. Does the panel agree that scrub became a dirty word in the lexicon of upland policy management, but it should in fact be celebrated as an essential component in a well-functioning upland landscape? Um, there we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely it should be celebrated. It's not only important from a biodiversity point of view, and it is one of the major missing components of our upland landscapes in Britain today. It's also, it also has really important functional roles from a peatland restoration point of view. So there's some really interesting and persuasive evidence out there that scrub on the edge of the peat mass um, plays a really important role in holding it together and in reducing the drawdown effect, which is the water that's lost from the edge of the peat mass. Um, uh, if you want more information about that, just Google Richard Lindsay and uh, you will probably find some really interesting models on that. So important. So, for example, if you go to peatlands outside of Britain, in general, you will find scrub as a component of those peatlands. Um, a proper wet and functioning body of peat won't allow trees to grow to any kind of significant height. Um, they won't allow, a proper wet bog won't allow trees to grow to the extent that they would start to dry it out. It's just about having a dynamic mosaic of habitats across the landscape, maximizing biodiversity, maximizing resilience, and actually everything knits together and functions as a whole. I really think it's a mistake for us to think of peatland and woodland and scrub as separate components. Um, and landscape scale restoration into the future, I really think, depends on us thinking bigger and thinking more joined up and more connected. Hope that helped a bit. Yeah, that's great. And um, Vince said he came from the denuded landscape of the Morn, so lots of work to do there. Um, the, next, the next question, um, I'm going to start with you actually, Lee, um, although anyone could answer it. Can the speaker say a bit more about how they measure the impact of their projects? in particular in respect to some of the tricky objectives like well-being, resilience and economic benefits. So I'll come to you, Lee, and I, I might just add a little bit after that as well. Over to you, Lee. Uh, I don't know if I can answer that. I might have to hand that over to Rhiannon. OK, well, in this case, you've, got, you, you've used your phone a friend button, which is um, which was uh, your get out of jail free card. So I'm going to introduce Rhiannon Niven, who's a uh, policy colleague. Rhiannon, do you want to just appear and see if you can answer that one? Yeah, so... I guess that with the large scale projects, we've got monitoring and evaluation systems in place that track that, but for the more, I guess, your softer results, um, you know, it's, it's part of our community engagement process where we speak with the community and our stakeholders and talk with them throughout the process to see how we can, obviously, if the project is a success and what we can do to improve it is what my would say. So it's more anecdotal, continuing to put a high priority on engagement and building on that. I'm not sure, Lee, if you have or Martin want to add to Well, that. yeah, I could add a little bit. I mean, I think that um, it, historically the RSPB has absolutely been brilliant at uh, assiduously setting targets for recovery of certain species, expansion of certain habitats, and we assiduously report on progress on a um, you know annual cycle and um, you know we, 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 we've, we've absolutely got into that cycle um, in terms of the wider socioeconomic benefits often for some projects we will have very clear benefits about jobs that we want to create uh, or indeed wider benefit what we have not got to yet which is where I think we and indeed anyone in the nature's 
conservation sector needs to get to is to be consistently literate in reporting on impact in terms of these wider uh, benefits for people, whether in terms of um, carbon uh, removal, whether it's in terms of um, jobs created, uh, you know, number of people that benefit from contact with the nature reserves. And it's something that we did when we produced our natural capital account for our English nature reserves. We were able to demonstrate that the benefits in terms of climate change and through volunteering and water management was two times the cost of managing for biodiversity. So it's something I think we all need to get better at, but it's a really, really good question. And the next one I've got is from Amy Wilcox. Could the speakers talk about the potential for private sector funding, opportunities and challenges? Um, um, I, I accidentally pressed my mute button. I'm going to look at you, see if anyone wants to take this. Um, otherwise, um, uh, I, yeah, I mean, the, the private sector, I mean, the, 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 go on, Jeremy, you go for it, go on. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the Endangered Landscapes Programme, which is funding uh, from uh, Elizabeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. So that's that's kind of a, it's it's a it's a trust in that instance. One of the things we are looking at, and I know the RSPB more widely is looking at, is uh, sources of carbon funding as well, whether for peatland restoration or woodland establishment. Uh, and I think it's going to become increasingly important that we that we do that. We have the odd approach from local businesses. We've had the odd discussion from. Uh, distilleries, which is always pleasant, um, but uh, it, it's early days yet to see to see where those will go. But I think certainly philanthropic funding is becoming more important, uh, and I think corporate support will be as well. Kate, and there we go. Just a quick one, really. I also think it's massively important that these nature-based solutions that deliver ecosystem services for everybody eventually are. Uh, a part of our economy and a part of how our economy works um, I don't I think there's a disconnect at the moment and I think that's something that we all have to try to work on together yeah I think absolutely there isn't really sort of functioning markets yet um, for uh, you know the carbon value of some of these sites but if we want to have a you know a, a cap and reduce cap on emissions from land use for example it will pay in future for the investment from the private sector to start investing in those and there are also all sorts of innovative schemes being run whereby for example farmers are paid not to pollute um, uh, you know and, and those sort of things I think are going to be increasingly coming to the fore. I'm going to move on to the next one because I've got quite a few coming through this one's from Sue Ansell how can communities support and or drive schemes like these in their in your, in your area so really the role of communities um, who would like to I know there's something if, all big NGOs like ourselves um, are, are, are trying to make sure we do in the right way. Um, Kate or Jeremy, either you want to dip in? Kate first, yeah. Well, I think for a start, I think volunteering is an amazing way for communities to join in. Um, without the volunteers at Dovestone, we would not have achieved half of what we have. So local people who brave all sorts of weathers to go out and plant sphagnum on the bog, in the hail, um, to put in heather bale dams, all that sort of thing. It's an amazing contribution um, and a people engagement as well. Um, and I think the other thing is there are community, group, community groups out there who are starting to purchase land and do their own rewilding based on the work that the, the rest of us have started. So if you look at groups like Heal, for example, um, but vol for us, volunteering is just the best way for community to get involved with us. Um, Jeremy, particularly for those south of the border, they might be, not be aware of some of the um, opportunities which the Scottish Government has been saying. Do you just want to say something a little bit about some of the land reform agenda? Yeah, there? the Scottish Government's got a very well-developed strategy for um, uh, to encourage land managers to uh, build uh, capacity and empowerment within local communities to influence decisions about land management that may affect them. Uh, and it's really, really very well laid out. If you look at the Scottish Land Commission's website, there's some excellent guidance there. Uh, I think all of the land managers in the Kingdoms Connect project have a good record of consulting uh, with communities, of, of particularly of place. Um, but what we're not great at yet, we can do much more work on, is, is empowering people and, and giving them more opportunity to influence the process and, and the outcomes of those discussions. Um, and, and that's not just about communities of place, but also communities of interest. Uh, so that the activity providers, the mountain bikers, the tourists, whoever. 
So uh, yeah, we, we're, we've not got a bad record, but there's no doubt we can do better. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy. And uh, yeah, the more people get involved in this agenda, the better, really. And uh, in the chat bar, uh, former colleague Chris Corrigan quite rightly referred to the incredible role of the likes of United Utilities, who are a partner in Dovestone and elsewhere in Northern England, that they play in terms of really investing in catchment management at scale. Um, uh, to deal with things like triple SI condition, also water discoloration issues. Um, I, th I think um, we probably got a chance for one more question, which is, um, I suppose I'm going to start with Mel on this one. Um, it's, it's really about, if the, the, Mel, you're allowed three, the top three issues from a policy point of view. Uh, I know that the you know, speakers did identify some that you think you want to leave with uh, colleagues today as those issues which you think would make a massive difference in terms of nature-based solutions in the UK. Do you want to start off? And if we have time, we might come to someone else and then I'm going to move to close. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the top three issues are, I'm going to start by saying, um, get, going back to my earlier point around principles of getting it right. Um, and I think um, when it comes to tree planting, there's this huge focus on trees at the moment, sort of politically and with the tree, tree strategy and with uh, the different parties uh, going up against each other to see who could plant the most trees in their manifesto and um, support planting for trees in their manifesto. And um, I think it's critical to say RSBB has done a lot of research looking at whether trees can really deliver for climate and ecosystems and a lot of research on that. So I would say investing in the right kind of trees and taking this critical time um, when we're looking to the long term, we're looking at, we have our sixth carbon budget coming up, we have the tree strategy, we've got our commitments internationally with the NDC, so making sure we get that right is absolutely critical. Um, taking a spatial approach is also really, really important um, and looking across the landscape, not just those long time scales, as I mentioned in my first point, but looking spatially. Um, again we've done um, mapping of where the high carbon high nature places are and we're looking at opportunities for restoration coming up and where those are best cited but we need to bring that spatial component um, into our work and I think that the final point I would say is just looking across the kind of that from practice to policy um, and making sure that we have a reality check you know really learning from some of the experiences that we've been talking about today and um, to look at deliverability so that we're really bringing people with us delivering the kind of co-benefits that we need to see um, and not just charging ahead with sort of purely carbon focused outcomes. Great. Um, thank you very much, Melanie. And actually, I'm going to move to wrap here. I'm going to say a massive thank you to Kate, to Lee and Jeremy as well, uh, and to all you've taken part. Um, uh, these webinars always sort of come thick and fast, really. And, and, and thanks so much for all of the questions that you've been um, putting on the screen. I mean, I think the key thing in this area is what we try to do is demonstrate you know, what most of you know, the value of nature and the contribution that it can make to dealing with the many societal problems that we face, whether it's climate change, whether it's water management, uh, whether it's about how we maintain our wealth, um, our well-being, uh, and indeed how we can make sure we've got a vibrant rural economy. Um, and at the same time, how do we deliver for more for wildlife? And, and, and I think that um, what the key thing is what I think that we're trying to demonstrate here, as indeed many other organisations do, is there are real tangible, practical projects which do demonstrate how you do it. And through those, you can identify what the future policy solutions might be to, to deliver more of that. So um, I really hope that you've enjoyed today. If you will continue the conversation, no doubt, um, in other fora. Uh, and I just want to leave you the final thought that when you have a moment when this, the government restrictions allow, wherever you are, please get to the Cairngorms, please get to Dovestone, please get to Medmary, Wallasey, Minsmere, any of other amazing coastal reserves. Uh, and I've just been reminded that we will reply to any unanswered questions in writing. And with that, I just want to say a massive thank you and take care.